Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest comes to us today via Zoom. We are honored to be joined by a very busy person who wears several hats, Dr. Michael Friedlander, the Vice President for Health Sciences and Technology at Virginia Tech, the Executive Director of the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute at VTC, and the Senior Dean for Research for the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. We'll explore how all of that works together to promote medical research and what the future holds. And welcome to Business Hat Matters, Dr. Friedlander. Thank you for making time for us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here, Gene. Well, before we, before we get into some of the particulars, um, talk about those three hats that you wear, uh, Michael, and how that all sort of fits together and meshes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was originally recruited to come here to Roanoke from Houston, Texas for the uh, first day job, which was the founding executive director of what is now called the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. And the charge there was to build up the biomedical research enterprise here at Virginia Tech and Carillion and Roanoke. Uh, uh, subsequently, I was asked to take on some additional leadership roles. One of them called the Senior Dean for Research at the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. And in that capacity, <clears throat> I really am involved with uh, oversight of the medical students carrying out their research projects. And then finally, my most recent title is Vice President for Health Sciences and Technology where the leadership of Virginia Tech asked me to take on a somewhat larger role, not just confined to the health sciences campus here in Roanoke, but to help facilitate the growth of health sciences across the whole Virginia Tech enterprise, including in Waxburg and our emerging uh, programs up in Washington, D.C. as well. Were some of the, uh, uh, Michael, were some of the, uh, some of the stuff going on at the FBRI now, was some of that taking place in Blacksburg or is this, is this a brand new uh, concept from the ground up 11 years ago? Yeah, that's also a very, a very good question. Um, the, the, the direct answer is it's truly a concept that was uh, initiated here from the ground up, from scratch. However, the answer has to be a little nuanced. It's not as if there was not already high quality biomedical research going on throughout the Virginia Tech system in Blacksburg. It's just that what was happening there was distributed, not focused in any one unit or organization, <clears throat> and wasn't really a main thrust. As everybody knows, of course, Virginia Tech is most well known for its engineering programs, which are fantastic and world class and already built on a very successful base. Lesser known was that there was indeed life sciences and biomedical research across the campus, but again, not really focused. Uh, and so the program here was really to build from scratch a program in Roanoke. So all of the people that worked in the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute were newly recruited and newly hired there have been one or two that have relocated the research programs from Blacksburg here, uh, but the bulk of everybody here were newly recruited researchers brought from outside, from all over the country and all over the world for that matter. Dr. Friedlander, how hard is it, how difficult is it to get a major research institute like this off the ground? I mean, how much of an undertaking is it? It's not something that happens every day, I assume. No, it doesn't happen every day and it is a major undertaking. Uh, I would say it, it, it had its difficulties and challenges. On the other hand, uh, I couldn't have imagined that it would have gone uh, better than it has. Uh, uh, we've been very successful and very fortunate. When I look back over the first decade now, I have to say most of that is due to people, of course. Uh, on the one hand, the leadership on the ground already here, particularly at Virginia Tech through the past president, uh, Charles Steger, the current president, Tim Sands, been fantastically supportive. And then uh, the role of provost at Virginia Tech, previously Mark McNamee, uh, now Cyril Clark, also phenomenally supportive. That made it easier. And then, and then really, as I started going out and recruiting the first wave of researchers to come in, we really targeted some very successful, high visibility people who were already at the top of their game. And that was not easy to get them to relocate from very established biomedical research enterprises to come here. But we we uh, made, made it attractive and great facilities and great people, and they're very entrepreneurial. And so them coming in helped those next waves to build on it. Uh, but, you know, if you look around the country to your question, most of the very successful biomedical research enterprises are at very well-established institutions that have been in the business 100 years, 200 years. 
Johns Hopkins University Medical Center up in Baltimore, for example, several hundred years, uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, Stanford, University of California, San Francisco, look down the road in North Carolina, Duke and University of North Carolina Research Triangle Park. So when it comes to something from scratch and new like this and getting off the ground that quickly and that successfully, it's, it's pretty unusual. Hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, in a lot of other, a lot of these other research institutes, uh, Michael, are they in much bigger urban areas? Is has it been attracting the people to the Roanoke Valley? Is it been a detriment, or is the outdoors and the the amenities is that somewhat of an asset for some of these teams that come in? Yeah, also a very very good question. Um, most of the people we've recruited in to lead research teams have come from those very established medical centers I'm talking about that tend to be in much larger urban areas. Uh, I myself came from Houston, Texas, from the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the United States and a, a city of 5 million people and recruited several people from there. And many of the other people I've recruited have come from that. <clears throat> so at first, it seemed like it might be a challenge being in a smaller area, the Roanoke area, of course, and also in an area that wasn't known for its biomedical research enterprise. People knew about Virginia Tech, of course, a very well-established powerhouse of a research university. But as I said before, more related to engineering and other areas and computation and so forth. And Carilion Clinic, fantastic healthcare organization, is mostly known in the region and locally. And so initially, the outreach to these, these stars, these tremendous innovative researchers, I had to do a lot of explaining about where Roanoke was and who these organizations were and why it was something they should look at. So, so it had its challenges associated with it. But the bottom line is, once they got here and saw the facilities we were building, they met with the leadership of Virginia Tech, the leadership of Carilion Clinic. I got to work with them. They saw the great facilities they would have and the area, Roanoke, the Roanoke Valley, they fell in love with it. So the, the city and the region really sells itself. So it was never a detriment. It was a matter of education at first to people about what's here. And when we get them here to look around, we've got them because people fall in love with the place and the community. It's that's not a hard part of this anymore at all. You know, as we go to as we go to taping, we just you just cut the ribbon a year delayed on the, the new expansion with the uh, Research Institute. What, what, what's the standing of the FBRI? Do you think, Michael, uh, eleven years into this, are you moving up in the uh, the pecking order of research institutes? Is it making it easier to uh, you know come into grants, things like that? Yeah, uh, I, I think we are. It, it's a short time, you know, in the context of the answer I gave a moment ago about the large institutions that have been around for centuries, we're only 11 years old. So, so we're still a startup. You know, we're really just taking baby steps, honestly. Hmm. But in that time, uh, the impact and the recognition has gone up quite, quite high. At the moment, the research grants that we compete for to bring in the money to do the research total almost $150 million. And that's from zero uh, 11 years ago. So that's, that's quite a fast rise. Um, we have about 37 teams of researchers here. And instead of distributing amongst 37 different things, they're really focused in three or four areas. So we're, we built critical mass to develop that recognition and reputation. As a matter of fact, I just did an analysis for our annual report of how impactful and recognized our researchers are. And one metric you can measure that by, you can actually track and measure how many times the published scientific discoveries and papers of your investigators are cited by others in the literature. And our number comes up at a quarter million. That's 247,000 citations of our researchers, our investigators. And I know that number might not mean much comparatively to most folks, but to have to take my word, that's a high number. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the other researchers in the country and the world are taking notice of the work here and they're citing it and referring to it in their work as well. So that's one metric to tell us we're, we're really moving up. The other is our success rates in competing for these grants at the National Institutes of Health. The average success or hit rate is maybe around 10, maximum 15%. We're hitting at 35 and to 40% range on those grants. Wow. And those are our peers reviewing us in, in Bethesda at the NIH who are very critical and they're awarding our grants at a much higher rate than nationally. So I think, I think those are metrics telling us something we're having an impact. When you count up things like the number of publications and grants and patents and all that, our numbers as a whole do not compete with the Johns Hopkins, the Harvards. And the reason is they're so much larger. They have so many more faculty. But if you normalize and say, what is our output per investigator? 
and we've analyzed the data that way, we're in the top 10% in the United States right now. Hmm. And since you mentioned it, Michael, talk about those areas of focus, the narrow areas of focus, instead of being spread out over all these different disciplines, talk about the areas that the FBRI is focused on. Yeah, it's a couple areas that are based on, number one, what we perceive as the most pressing medical need, uh, certainly for the region, but also for the entire nation and the world for that matter. What is the scientific opportunity to really make a difference in certain areas? And where can we really differentiate ourselves? The Virginia Tech Carillion Enterprise, the Fraley Biomedical Research Institute, where can we stand out? So we, so we looked at all those things and we continue to reevaluate that but we pretty much landed on a few areas. The biggest one by far, and the one I think our national and global reputation is extremely high at this point, is in brain research and what's called neuroscience. And so that has been our major focus. I myself am a neuroscientist. When I was being recruited here, I told the leadership, I said, look, this is what you get. This is what I know best. This is what I do. And I think you know, we can, I can really get us going in that area. Um, and so that's been a real strength. And that relates to a whole range of things that affect the brain. And by the way, brain disorders will affect one out of every four Americans sometime in their lifetime. When you, say, br when you, say, br when you say brain disorder, sorry, uh, are you talking about Alzheimer's, dementia, or some other type of disorder? I I'm talking about all of them. So yeah, I put them in a large bucket and I was just going to sort of list. So uh, during aging process, what we call neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. During development for children, what are called developmental or intellectual disabilities, things like autism spectrum disorder, for example. Injuries to the brain, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, uh, addiction and substance abuse, addiction to opiates, uh, alcohol abuse, et cetera, um, and a whole host of things. So all those taken together as a brain disorder of one type or another will impact directly one out of every four Americans. And the economic impact on the country is absolutely profound as well. So it's an important area. And we've hired some of the very best and brightest in that area and are already making a big difference. So that's one area of focus, a major one. Hmm. Our second major area of focus is on the number one cause of mortality in the United States uh, and in the world, which is heart disease. And so we built a very strong, what we call cardiovascular research enterprise, people that work on the heart itself, the blood vessels doing research on a whole host of areas. Again, just like the brain, it's not just one aspect of heart disease. For example, it's not just what we call ischemic heart disease where blood flow is interrupted to a part of the heart and you have a heart attack. We have people working on that, but you also have people working on arrhythmias, abnormal patterns of electrical activity in the heart that can lead to sudden cardiac death. We have people working at the interface of, of nutrition and obesity and cardiometabolic disease. So cardiovascular in general. And then the third major area for us is cancer. Uh, and, but again, we're very focused. We're not, we're not approaching all cancers. We're small and focused. And by far, our biggest focus in cancer research is at the interface with the other area, neuroscience, it's on brain cancers and in adults and children. And as it turns out, there are some very deadly forms of brain cancer that affect kids. Interestingly, those same brain cancers that affect kids affect our pets, our dogs, and, and occur spontaneously. So we have this great connection because of the vet school at Virginia Tech and we have veterinary oncology research here at Freyland Biomedical Research Institute collaborating with our researchers doing human-based brain cancer research and with our researchers in Washington, D.C. with our new partner, the Children's National Hospital, working on pediatric brain tumors as well. So those are our three major areas of focus. It's interesting, and I've read this, that the, the, the brain cancers in dogs sort of mimics brain cancers in humans so the data, the research can transfer. That's exactly right. It's, a, it's fascinating. So much of research we do in the laboratory on things like cancer, for example, um, we, we tend to try to recreate the disease that occurs naturally in a human in the lab. And that might be in, in a dish with cells. It can be working with a mouse, a laboratory mouse, for example. And while that's extremely informative in many cases, it's not perfect. That is, it's not the condition actually happening spontaneously in a human being, for example. And so as it turns out, when it comes to dogs, several cancers of which one are these brain cancers I'm talking about, a very, uh, a very aggressive form called glioblastoma multiform. Um, the one that occurs in dogs, what's called a canine glioma, has a number of properties at the molecular and cellular level that are virtually identical to those in humans and particularly in children, in pediatric brain tumors. There's a tremendous similarity and that occurs naturally. If you think about it, our pets, in many cases, at least my dog, 
shares my environment. My dog is in my house, usually eats table scraps, some of the same food that I eat, gets out on the lawn, maybe inhales chemicals that are sprayed on the lawn. So we share this world and this planet in many ways. And if there indeed are triggers from the environment for some of these things, they could be common to us and our pets as well. So this is a way to inform human treatments with research with dogs. And I should say the research with dogs, they're patients. These dogs are patients that come to our veterinarians at our Animal Cancer Care and Research Center to receive treatment. And they'll get either the best standard of care or a new innovative treatment to be treated. They're not experimental subjects. They're part of a study, just as humans are part of studies as well. But it benefits them because they're patients being treated as well. Hmm. Well, since this is a business show, Michael, let's talk about, I know, I know this is important to you, how some of the things you're doing at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute are spinning off into commercial ventures and the potential for that. I know Rob Gordy with Tiny Cargo and uh, uh, Warren Bickle's addiction team developing an app. Talk about some of that and what the future holds there. Yeah, we've been, we've been very encouraging uh, and recognizing of our researchers who have the idea to go beyond just the academic enterprise with the research and take it out to actually do something to help people. And so, so much of research we do in an academic setting in our laboratories, of course, we, we write papers and publish them, we compete for grants, we go to meetings to present our work, but who's listening? Who's listening are our colleagues, other scientists and researchers. And that's a very important part of the process. So it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. If you really wanna make a difference and have an impact, you wanna take that next step and get the work and the discovery out there. And how do you do that? Well, we live in a, in a society, in a, a structure, uh, with a, a capitalistic uh, type of a market. And the way things work is you have to commercialize things and get them out there to the public, have people invest in them, and then have trials and get them to be used. So a number of our investigators have the whole package. They're doing the academic part of the research, the research in their labs, getting the grants, publishing the papers, teaching, all those things. But on top of that, they'll develop intellectual property, file their patents, and then commercialize and start a company. So we have a number of examples of those. You mentioned Rob Gordy. Rob is a fantastic cardiovascular researcher, but he also works in cancer and wound healing, a number of areas, and he's a serial entrepreneur. He started at least three companies, and uh, his most recent, you mentioned Tiny Cargo, is a fantastic example of, in this case, developing a way to deliver therapeutics to different parts of the body very precisely using uh, small things called exosomes extracted from cow's milk with a great partnership with our local uh, dairy homestead creamery, for example. Uh, Warren Bickle, who's a, a behavioral researcher who studies addiction and also studies health behaviors, came up from his fundamental research, understanding how the brain makes decisions and how we value the future or not, has taken that and developed it into an app, basically, working with uh, people with their cell phones. And one of his former postdoctoral fellows, Sarah Snyder, is now the CEO of a company they started called Beam Diagnostics, uh, Beam, B-E, standing for Behavioral Economics. So it's a behavioral economic approach to people who have substance abuse or addiction to use what we've learned about how the brain values or discounts the value of the future to give people reminders about good things in the future and change their behavior. And they've had some very promising preliminary results with people with alcohol use disorder getting this to work. And then we have a number of other people who have spun off companies in cancer research and various other areas. So this, this entrepreneurial spirit is something we celebrate and reward in our researchers. And it not only has the, the impact you'd like to, to see it really helping people, but it's contributing, we hope, to the local economy and the vibrancy of the Roanoke area. Now, these are, these are small startup companies. They're not employing hundreds of people and so forth, just a few people at the moment. And they're getting initial investments from other you know, investors in the area and outside the area. But we hope they'll continue to grow and that this place, the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute, acts as a magnet for other entrepreneurs to come here and even larger companies to want to position some of their satellites to be near what's going on here. Michael, when you look at the future, and, and this is one of the ways I think the FBRI was sort of uh, pitched, but uh, do you see the potential for hundreds of jobs or more being set up in the Roanoke Valley, between Roanoke and maybe the New River Valley, based off of spinoffs coming from the FBRI? Do you see that potential down the road? I absolutely do. Um, we have about 450 people working now at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute. 
with the grand opening of our new building that we've already started recruiting people into, we expect to have about another 450 or so there. So there'll be just there, there'll be close to a thousand people working in the, the two buildings of the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. But to your question, what about these spinoffs and what about the private enterprise around it? So at the moment, again, it's small. We've spun up about a half dozen companies, a couple employees each and so forth. Some of them will hit and hit big. And actually, one of Rob Gordy's companies has already started to go into that next phase of larger investment. Uh, Warren Bickle's company has got a second round of technology transfer investment. So they'll, they'll continue to grow and spin out and attract more employ employees. One of the challenges will be to keep them here. Mm -hmm. Frankly, as these companies get very successful, people notice them and say, hey, why don't you come to Boston? Why don't you come to Silicon Valley? We had an investigator here in the very first few years named Jamie Tyler, who spun out a company that was doing some very exciting things with modulating brain activity. And uh, some investors came to town and offered to make major investment in the tens of millions of dollars, but said only if the company moves to Boston. And the company did move to Boston. That was our second year, I believe. I think we've gotten a little more savvy about how to deal with those things and the ecosystem here in the Roanoke Valley and in, also in the New River Valley around entrepreneurism has continued to grow. Uh, we got a lot of help from Virginia Tech and Carilion you know, local investors. So I don't think that's going to be as big a problem, but we have to work hard to do that. I, I think it's not too much to say to expect at least an equivalent number of jobs to the thousand or so at the Research Institute in the private sector spinning out around this. So another thousand or so over the next 10 years or so. That won't happen tomorrow, but I think we're on the right trajectory to do that. All right, uh, Doc, a couple of minutes left. Dr. Freeland, I know we've, you've talked to me about this before. Um, uh, about maybe creating some sort of another incubator outside of that environment at the FBRI, maybe with lab space that can co, you know, that can be shared. I know Rob Gordy, Tiny Car was over at Ramp this this, sem this semester, but uh, is that something you're still looking at down the road, having that extra space for uh, people to, independently from the FBRI to kind of work on their next great idea? Absolutely. It is a key essential element to accomplishing the things we just talked about. And we are working on it very hard at the moment. And uh, I think we have some very promising opportunities ahead. We've been working closely with the city to look into that. We're working with Virginia Tech and the Virginia Tech Foundation and Carillion Clinic. And we even have a, a partner I mentioned earlier, we have a new partnership in Washington, D.C. with what's called the Children's National Hospital. We have, we have researchers up there. And in the building up there, we have researchers. They have a company, Johnson & Johnson, has something called J-Labs, where they nurture startup companies in biotechnology. And we've been working with the Johnson & Johnson J-Labs folks to see if they would be interested in partnering down here with us in the Roanoke area. So we're working on multiple fronts at the same time. That's essential. It, it's, the ramp is a fantastic opportunity to mentor our new startup companies and people, but we also need laboratory space for them outside of the Freeman Biomedical Research Institute to do their work. So getting an accelerator in Roanoke with a biomedical focus is a key part of that plan. Just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to mention the innovation corridor that you're a part of. And I know I heard you talk to Roanoke County officials a, couple, a year ago about envisioning this whole corridor running basically all the way into Roanoke County, maybe all the way to Carilion Children's and that whole area mixed use development, that type of thing. Is that something that you think the FBRI can help fuel that growth? Absolutely. I, I really think that, you know, the, the centroid of that, when you think about the geography, as you mentioned, if you're running out down uh, Franklin and go down towards the uh, uh, shopping center where uh, Carillion has their new children's area, for example, and then if you run back the other way from where we are towards downtown Roanoke, down Jefferson, that entire corridor tied together right here at the heart of it you have the uh, Riverside uh, Circle campus with the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute, the medical school, Carillion clinics, outpatient clinics, et cetera. And I, I, I think people uh, want to be around those things and they'll want to live in these areas and be close. So it's a natural. The key, in my opinion, is connectivity, making it safe and easy for people to move between those spaces. Sure, they may be driving their car, but they may be riding their bike or walking. And we have some beautiful spaces. The city's already done some great work with sidewalks in that area. And I, I ride it every day and I can feel it starting to come together. We have to connect all the pieces, but this will be a real hub and the natural beauty around it has us competing with other places that we can be hands down. I really think this is the future and this is gonna work very well. Got about a minute left, but just talk about where you think you are at the uh, Fralin Institute. Are you, are you still an infant? Are you an adolescent? Are you approaching adulthood? Where do you think you are? Yeah, I think we're young adults. I like the <laughs> analogy. Um, 
you know, we study, we study development of the brain here and they say, uh, we, we now say that you have to be about 25 years old for your brain fully developed. We used to think it was done by puberty. And so I'd say we're right about there. We're, we're young adults, which means we have great ideas, lots of energy, maybe the most productive time of a scientist's life are those early days and time in your career. And I think we're right there. We're about to hit a pinnacle, keep growing, uh, but it's an exciting time and we really launched second decade. You're gonna see a lot happen at the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. And I would imagine if you recruit another four or 500 people, Michael, there's gonna be a lot more energy in the building as well. Oh yeah, we're already seeing that. We have people moving back and forth between the, the original building and the new building. We have a connecting skyway there, bumping into each other in the walkway. I see conversations going on, ideas, people going to whiteboards. That's what you wanna have, those collisions, the intellectual vibrancy, uh, what some of my colleagues call the uh, hum in the halls. And you can feel it, you can sense it when you're here. There's a lot of energy here. Well, well I'm excited. Uh, Dr. Michael Friedlander from the uh, Freeland Biomedical Research Institute at VTC. We're gonna have to leave it there, but Michael, thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome, thank you. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.